get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Second down, six Throwing to the end zone Touchdown, Presbyterians Joey Gilkey, the tight end and play fake, looking to roll. Griffin and his pass, Gilkey complete. Gilkey hurdles the defender. That could be an ESPN highlight as he uh, makes his way for a first down. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of RX Bar. And um, they sold to Kellogg for $600 million, but I talked to them and how they built that company up. Really interesting. They're, they bootstrap that. It's amazing. And the P90X founder, Tony Horton, talks about how he made money as a street mime before selling hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, Joey, I love talking about the, the not so great stories. You know, he would put his hat on the street um, to make food and rent money. That's how he made money when he went cross country. Um, Baby Einstein founder um, was a cancer assassin twice. She, she suffered cancer and beat it. Um, Atari founder, Nolan Bushnell, talked about how when Steve, he was Steve Jobs' mentor, Steve offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. That'd be a lot of money leaving on the table. Um, so check out inspiredinsider.com for more interviews. Um, the episode today is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Um, at Rise25, we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners. Not to mis- be mistaken by Joey's Dream 500, which I read, I'm like, I got to talk to this guy because he has a Dream 500. He, he just showed us up with a Dream 500 and we're like, we're only Dream 100. But we create a systemized incoming referral pipeline, which generates ROI using a podcast. And podcasting, in a lot of, for many years, people didn't know this. Podcasting is much more personal for me because it's not just about your business. It's about you leaving a legacy for yourself and your guests. And it was inspired by Um, my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor, and he and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany, and they were the only members of their family to survive. But his words and legacy live on because an interview, um, an interview with the Holocaust Foundation, they did with him, and I could watch it every year. I could watch it every week if I wanted to. I do watch it every year, and it's on my about page on my website. So um, yes, podcasting can help your business, but it also helps you and your guests leave a legacy. And I do personally credit it as the single best thing I've done for my business and my life outside of meeting my wife, because she doesn't like when I say that, but because of all the amazing relationships I've made. And we handle 99% of the work so our clients can focus on the best use of their time, which is relationships. And our clients will range from a Berkshire Hathaway company to agencies, to lawyers, consultants, SaaS companies, and other B2B businesses. And we make sure you get ROI. We've been working with podcasters since 2009. So I believe if you have a business, you should have a podcast period, kind of like you have a website. Um, but if you have thought about starting a podcast, do it. Email us if you have questions at support at rise25media.com. I am excited to introduce today's guest. And thank you, Ian Garlic, for recommending today's guest and talking about today's guest. Um, and today we have Joey Gilkey, founder of tribeprospecting.com. And what they do is they help businesses land six and seven figure contracts with their dream 500 clients through account-based selling. And this is an interesting fact. If they don't deliver, they personally buy you a Tesla. And that's actually in their contract. And talk about an amazing risk reversal. You know, Joey, as I read your stuff, I think reading your stuff, you know, describe how you describe your business is a marketing lesson in itself. So people should check out your LinkedIn. They should check out your website and they have a, and we're going to break some of these things down. They have a multi-discipline, multi-channel, hyper-personalized, highly targeted account-based sales outreach to the list of your 500 dream clients over the course of a year. And we will find out more about what that means. And they do what most outbound sales agencies are not willing or able to do. And we will break all these things down. And fun facts about Joey on a personal note, which I find fascinating. We may or may not get into these things, but he played college football. So you can watch highlights on ESPN. I mean, YouTube uh, about his highlight uh, football days. He was a theater major and he also has a genetic mutation, which we may or may not talk about. And that's 
that's, a, you know, I'm, I'm not joking around when I say he has actually has a genetic mutation, but Joey, thank you for, for joining me. Jeremy, thank you for that incredible intro. That's it's all awesome. true. And I want to break you down, your research. yeah, I want to break down, not right this second, but multi-discipline, multi-channel, because all those things can be broken down further. But I, we were talking on the phone um, previous to this um, a couple days ago, and we were talking about favorite customized gifts. And what you guys do is very personalized. So I want to hear some of your top three favorite customized gifts you've sent to clients or you've sent on behalf of clients. What are your, what sure. are your top ones, yeah. top stories? I'm trying to think of the one that I, I shared with you previously, but uh, I've got I remember, but I want to let you go wherever you go. I'll, I'll mention right. that one. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, my, I'd say some of my favorites. Um, I actually just recently sent one that was um, received very well. Uh, it landed me $250,000 in revenue. So I guess it went well. Um, but I, I mean, it was pretty simple. I sent this guy, uh, a cigar box. I found out he loves cigars. Uh, we do again, account based selling. So we treat every account like it's its own campaign. So everyone gets something different. And uh, I found this guy is a, a cigar, whatever they're the, the, the aficionado special or word. something. Yeah. Aficionado <laughs> kind of like a Psalm is for wine. And, uh, I spent quite a bit of money. Uh, on, on this custom engraved uh, cigar box that was uh, had nothing about me in there. Uh, I didn't put our logo on it. I didn't, um, you know, put my business card in there. I literally just wrote him a handwritten note and said, hey, uh, little birdie told me that you like this. This is your favorite cigar. Here's an entire box full of them. And here's an engraved, um, you know, humidor, if you will. Hmm. And uh, that went super well. Uh, another one, which actually I recall now, the one that we talked about. Mm-hmm was I sent a wine bottle. You sent uh, so many cool gifts, I can't even remember like the one yeah. you told me. <laughs> it was a, a wine bottle that um, yeah. had, a, had a white label on it. Literally, it was just completely blank. And uh, I wrote, this. I found out this guy liked uh, a certain type of poetry, or this certain poet was one of his favorite writers. And so I looked up one of the famous poems I wrote on this, this bottle of wine in really nice handwriting. Uh, it wasn't me who wrote it. I don't have great handwriting. So someone else had to write it for me. And, uh, and then I wrote a card, put it in this Oak box that had, um, that one did have our logo engraved on that box, but, um, had that engraved on there, sent it to him. And, uh, that turned into a long lasting relationship as well. Uh, outside of that, I've done a bunch of signed helmets, you know, mm -hmm. tickets, season tickets to, you know, their favorite college team, just random stuff that my whole goal is to surprise and delight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my vision for that is it's going to cost me way more than using a $69 a month automation tool. Um, but I'm going to develop a relationship and that's going to pay far more dividends than me hitting send on an automation tool. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's a little bit. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, I want to break some of those down. Um, so we say multi-discipline, multi-channel, hyper-personalized. We talked a little about the hyper-personalized part um, and highly targeted. So what do you mean by multi-discipline, multi-channel? Yeah, so multi-discipline is, is, so if you think about like in the grand scheme of marketing and sales, uh, there are all sorts of disciplines, right? So there's someone who's an incredible copywriter, someone who's good at um, persuasive language. There is... Uh, you know, uh, trying to think of other ones. So PPC, those are, those are disciplines that, you know, analytics types of like, things like that channels are where that discipline is expressed. So if you're a good copywriter, it doesn't mean that you just send good email. It means that you're also potentially going to be used for direct mail, writing handwritten notes or LinkedIn messaging or whatever it might be. If you're a persuasive speaker, that might mean getting on stages. That might mean podcasts. That might mean, um, being able to send voice memos and things like that in the outreach. And so multidiscipline is what it is your skill set is. Multi-channel mm. is where that skill set is expressed. Yeah. So what kind of channels do you utilize? Obviously, you talked about direct mail. What else mm -hmm. do you use? Yeah. So we have a 36 tactic pick list that when we onboard a client, we do our discovery, we understand them their ideal dream clients. We build that dream 500 list. Um, hence the name dream 500. Um, and what we do with that really is we take that, that information and we understand, okay, what is the context of their offer, their market, where they're positioned in that market? 
um, and, and who is their customer uh, relative to that offer in that market. And so we call it the forfeits. But what's really interesting is that uncovers certain tactical things that might be, you know, we're never married to any tactic, right? Like we, we believe that when you fall in love with a particular tactic or get romantic about a tactic, um, you're in hot water because naturally with cycles and technology and trends, tactics expire. And if you're banking on one particular or a few particular ones, then uh, you're going to be in hot water eventually. And so uh, for us, some of those platforms are the obvious. So cold email, cold call, uh, social selling. So that's the obvious LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, and then some of the more traditional mediums, um, some advertising outlets, uh, direct mail. We believe in gifts are uh, incredible for uh, being able to actually get in front of and, and build trust and authority pretty quickly. Um, and then even like we talked about earlier, like speaking and podcasts and things like that, if we see it as a fit, um, that might be in part of our roadmap and whether we deliver that or we have a partner that delivers that, that's, um, that's usually to be determined in the discovery. How long does it take to help clients figure out their dream 500? I, I feel like people would have mm. problem f- figuring out their dream 25 sometimes. Yeah. So for us, uh, we have a very, we're very process driven. So when we onboard a client, I mean, you should see our Asana um, onboarding. It's, it's intimidating if you don't really know what you're doing in there, but um, our onboarding is so structured and so process driven. A lot of that is meant to uncover interesting facts and data about you, your company, your market, and uh, you know, your, your ideal client. And so we'll do everything from intake forms to personality assessments and things like that on the front end. Um, and that helps uncover some little, you know, tidbits that are helpful for us. On top of that, we do a one-on-one interview with our director of strategy, who is just an incredible interviewer. And he, he extracts really valuable information that you wouldn't have thought of yourself, but just through his questioning and, and things that he asks, he uncovers mm-hmm. awesome stories and different different little things in the market, um, which help also define value prop and, and things like that a little bit more. Um, but it, it really doesn't take very long when you have a system like we have to, mm. to develop that. Usually you have an idea of some of your favorite clients you've worked with. Um, and when we say dream 500, it's, it's usually an intersection of like, who, who have you enjoyed working with the most? Mm-hmm. Who do you deliver the best results for? And where are your best margins? Mm-hmm. And if at, at the intersection of all three of those is usually your dream client. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's, it's not only are, are you going to work with people that love you and you love them, you have trust built there. Uh, you also know that you can deliver for them, uh, which means it's going to have a long lasting, you know, a longer um, time or less churn, higher LTV. Yeah. And then, and then on top of that, where are your margins? So uh, you might love working with someone, but if they <laughs> require a lot of you and you do extra on top of that and they have scope creep, you know, you lose your margins. Um, so for us, it takes us about less than 30 days to develop that list. Oh. Um, and it's usually running in the background of us setting up all of our other processes for the outreach. Joey, do you ever offer those as a separate service for people or do they have like just to, developing dream 500? Right. Or do you, do they have to work with you ongoing to execute on that? Uh, we do not offer that, okay. but I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I think <laughs> you should. I'm, I'm curious yeah. of how much you would charge for that. I mean, it's worth a lot of money. Mm-hmm. To, to the right client. Right. You know, I mean, obviously you want to work with people long term, but I was, yeah. I'm curious because I could see a lot of people like, yeah, sign me up, Joey, like for that process. Yeah, it's, days, it's incredibly valuable. You know, it's a lot of work up front. So it makes sense for you guys to obviously do the heavy lifting, which most people, when you're done with that, they're like, oh my God, that's a lot of work. <laughs> you know? Like yes. what you've uncovered, it's very valuable, but it's also a lot of work. It is. Yeah. So, and that's, we don't mean to do it this way. But I'm I think thinking personally, I'm like, I'll hire you for the dream 500 for our dream 500, you know, like, so <laughs> right. you just got a customer. I'll take for it. it. Yeah. Um, nice. I'll take it. Um, you know, I want to, I will go, we'll talk about currently, but I want to go back in time because how, you know, you grew up shaped how you are now. And, mm-hmm. um, so, I mean, we don't go have to go as far back, but I want to hear at least how, you, you were, thought you were going to go into the ministry, right? Yeah. At some yep. point. And I don't know if something, you know, childhood wise shaped you, your, your, your parents, as far as entrepreneur, were they, were they entrepreneurial or how did you get that bug? 
No. No. Yeah. So both ministry and entrepreneurship were not necessarily uh, inherited. Uh, I didn't grow up in the church. I also didn't grow up with entrepreneurial parents, but I did grow up with uh, very driven parents. My dad is incredibly successful. He works at Home Depot um, and does really well there. He work, he's pretty high up in the headquarters there mm-hmm. doing national sales for them. Um, so I did, I have always gotten a drive from him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that actually reared its head mostly in sports. I mean, we talked about, I played college football. Yeah. Um, I also played high level baseball, could have played, you know, two sport athlete in division one college, both baseball and football. I just didn't have the time. Um, it's hard enough to have time for to. that. Yeah. What did your dad, was your dad an athlete or where do you get that? Yes. Incredible, yeah, incredible athlete. Yeah. My dad played minor league baseball, mm. um, blew out his knee. I believe it was either the Florida Marlins, or the New York Mets mm. minor league what training camp. Did he play? He, I believe he's center field. Okay. He was center fielder. I was a little bit huskier of a fella. I'm 6'3", 245 What'd you play? Pounds. Third base? What? Third base. Yeah. Third base. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice guess. So... How did football shape you then? Just discipline wise? Or? It shaped me in a, in a couple ways. I would say, yes, discipline. Uh, I have my wife, it drives her nuts. I cannot be late to things. Mm. <laughs> I've, uh, we used to have this thing called sunrise, which if you were ever late to a class, late to a meeting, um, you know, ever got in trouble for whatever reason, you had sunrise, which was essentially 4 a.m. Uh, on the pond, which is the Ponderosa at our college. And uh, 4 a.m., you're there until the sun comes up, pretty much. So, what do you do? And it's the, it's the you're winter. You're supposed to run or Man. what? Running would be nice. No, it was, uh, we would, so there used to be a group of people. I only went twice. Um, and I learned my lesson after being <laughs> Never late again. Um, yeah. I thought I would learn nothing the first time, but we did this one time, and it's different every time. Sometimes it's, it's uh, you have to uh, bear crawl and pull uh, rubber t- like tires with you in your bear crawl, Wow, which is terrible. The other one was uh, these sleds. They're about 250 pound sleds and they would make the linemen, like you'd essentially have to push it a hundred yards with people on it. Mm. And then uh, for a total of, of uh, the equivalent of a mile. Uh, um, so you had to do that, I don't know how the yardage there, roughly 2000 yards. So 20 wow. down and backs on the football field. That was brutal. I learned my lesson. So I can't be late. Uh, so that's one mm. thing discipline wise. Um, I think also just by the nature of being in an environment where it's extremely good athletes. Um, yes, I'm competitive. I'm extremely goal oriented. You know, I'm still a division one record holder for my position. And I think mm. a lot of that I could attribute to. For what? What was the record? Uh, total touchdowns in a career for a tight end. Wow. Um, for my division. So that, uh, that's a fun little tidbit as well. But uh, I think what I probably took away most from college football and football in general was the exposure I had to different upbringings and cultures. So I have a huge heart for, and I can attribute to football and my teammates, uh, inner city kids. So, you know, the ages of 14 to 22 guys who are kind of in that critical point in their life, but don't have a support system. Um, and that has carried me into how I interact with the inner city now and how I even hire some positions that, um, you know, are reflective of my desire to care for that community. Um, yeah. so what did you see? What did you see? Um, was this in high school or more in college? More in college. More in college. Um, so athletes come all over the world. Uh, a lot of them are, you know, inner city minority, uh, kids who come from a, you know, a, a rougher Rough background. But of, yeah. yeah. And so what I saw, one was a lot of them didn't have father figures, um, which comes with a whole host of issues. Uh, the second was even after graduation, a lot of guys who had the same degree as me go back home where they don't have a support system. They don't have connections. They don't have a network. Um, and they just, they end up working a job they could have got without the college degree. Mm. And, you know, I think that was something that really, uh, it really shaped the way I view. There's a couple of books I've read too. One's called One Helping Hurts talks about um, just the, the difference between socioeconomic statuses and, and the issues that minorities face that maybe someone like me who grew up fairly middle, uh, you know, middle class white kid, you know, in the suburbs, at least for the latter half of my childhood. Hmm. 
And um, yeah, just the difficulty that they have, things that we don't really see um, from the outside looking in. And I think I finally got to see it a little bit as I followed a lot of my teammates who I grew very close to um, after college and, and saw a lot of them fall into careers and even crime um, with a four-year you know, college degree from a private liberal arts school that paid them $52,000 a year for a scholarship. You know, mm. and it, went, it went to waste. So I think that's it's a passion for me to, yeah. to try to bridge that gap a little bit. Uh, it's very difficult. Yeah. So you feel like the support system was huge. And when they get into that environment yeah. in college and then, you know, cause I do have this in my notes to ask about this. Cause I know, you know, you do like to hire um, and have, you know, people in the inner city and give them a shot when maybe other people mm -hmm. aren't giving them a shot. I do. Yeah. I, I like to think that I have my own internal, uh, like feeder program, if you will, that I'm trying to develop where mm. you know, I have one guy specifically right now who, uh, he doesn't know this. So hopefully he doesn't listen to this, but you know, I hired him because I saw a lot of potential there and he is gifted yeah. in, in his creativity. Just yeah. Has to be hopefully he does better. listen to that. Yeah. And, yeah. but I think I'm paying a lot of the reason I'm paying him, I don't necessarily need his position as much as I'm paying him for, but I'm paying him to keep him around so that I can continue to mentor and, and facilitate. Yeah. Like my goal for him is to go back to Memphis where he came from and take the skill sets he learned uh, both as, in, in his craft, but then also how to run a business. My goal would be two years from now that Ron leaves mm. and starts his own business in, in Memphis and he hires some of his old, you know, community members and he creates a living just like I'm creating a living for people that it's essentially a pay it forward type of thing mm. where he goes back and impacts his community. Cause at the end of the day, uh, there, there's something called the white savior complex where what is it? The white savior okay. complex where it's it's almost like we as white. I don't want this to be offensive, and I don't want to get into a race thing, but I think oftentimes we think we can go into a, an inner city community minority and make the most impact, right? It's, it's that white savior complex, is what mm. they call it. Um, but what I've actually found is I think that the most impact comes from raising up indigenous leaders, hmm. and, and you can look at it from a mission standpoint too. If if you hmm believe that you the white man go to Africa in a certain village and you're going to make the most impact that's probably not the case you have to raise up a local leader so that when you leave or when you depart they're there on a huge void exactly so mm -hmm. that's that's my vision is to, to raise up indigenous leaders hmm. and I think a lot of that comes in the form of business and jobs and helping the economy by giving people skill sets and giving them opportunities that you know uh, maybe they wouldn't have yeah. gotten somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, I think someone like Ron or whoever, it's, it's the same as, I mean, as pro sports, right? Like you invest in someone in the minor league system because they, you see great potential to go to the That's major right. leagues. Right. And so yeah. I, I, you know, it's, it's the same thing that you see a certain potential and you're like, this, this guy could be a superstar and yes. I'm going to help him get there. Right. Absolutely. And I think again, back to the support system thing, like I think that, uh, Again, I don't want to be offensive, but maybe I do if you want to get views on this thing. But, uh, hey, you know, I, this, you're, you're, for you're it. the guest. You're, this <laughs> right? is your view. Yeah, totally. So what, you know, the, the phrase white privilege is thrown around quite a bit. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding around what that term actually means. And I think that it doesn't mean that you didn't work for what you got. It didn't, doesn't mean that Joey didn't, it didn't have that competitive drive and, and that desire to, to be excellent. Um, and that's where I, you know, how I got here. I think white privilege means that sometimes we just have different starting lines. We're all running the same race and, and I might've had a little bit more opportunity. I may have had a little less people look at me and, and question, you know, my upbringing, et cetera, because I grew up as a white middle-class kid who played football and, you know, went to a decent school and all these different things. Uh, there's not as many stigmas against me necessarily. Yeah. As there might be would, some so would someone argue of, with you on that? Yeah. You, oh, yeah. You think they would? I've had people argue with me before. I mean, it's mostly because they can't see past the word white privilege. I think that just slapped mm. on as a label. They just, you know, see red and they, they go get, after that. They get offended and then they don't hear the rest of the story. Right. I like to try to throw a caveat in there of, at the end of the day, uh, this is not to discredit your hard work at all. I just want you to see this from a perspective of maybe there's different starting lines, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and we're all running the same race and we can all get to the same finish line, Yeah. but the starting line might be a different place. And so I think that's, it's an encouragement 
you know, to both sides of the party, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's, that's no, my I appreciate you sharing it. No, I appreciate you yeah. sharing it. And um, because I, when I was doing research on you, Joey, and, you know, you talked about shifting away from the ministry, you, you set, use an expression that you said, I experienced poverty, you know, while you mm-hmm. were um, in the ministry or, yep. uh, yeah, right. So I wanted to find out more about what that, what that means. What did you experience? Sure. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm super thankful for it. So for me, after college, I did go into ministry for a little over a year. Uh, I actually married my wife who was in ministry, full-time ministry for uh, seven or eight years. Um, so what does that look like when you, when you say I, I was in the ministry for a year, what, what are you doing? Yeah. So I was actually on a campus university of Tennessee, mm-hmm. um, doing full-time ministry. So outreach, developing a community, um, mm-hmm. trying to bring people together for the purpose of sharing our faith, um, and impacting people. And, um, in order to do that, in order to do my job, I had to raise support. And there's a certain threshold in which we were able to raise. Uh, so my wife and I, we lived off of uh, 12 grand each. Um, so $24,000 over, you know, a little over a year together. And so I got to, I got to learn uh, what it looks like to, to live a little bit under the, I mean, I was on Obamacare. It's pretty cool. I mean, I paid 90 bucks a month for hundred percent coverage and no deductible. That's great. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> Sign me up. Um, no, I, in all seriousness, I, it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot on one valuing the dollar. Uh, it also taught me that I don't need as much as I think I need and, and material things do not equate to happiness. Um, I think that, I think that money solves a lot of problems, but I don't think it solves the overarching problems that we all you know, strive for. So, um, yeah, that was my, my short season of power. I want to act like I lived in poverty for years and years. I was on food stamps, but Again, I had a great support system around me. Um, came, you know, we moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, that's where my wife grew up originally. So we had a lot of great community around us that supported us in many other ways outside of just finances. Um, but I did get to see a little bit of what it's like to to have to worry about the paychecks, yeah, you know, and, and the bills and what what comes in this month versus you know you're banking on a supporter sending you a check and they hit hard times and so therefore they can't pay your support that month. Um, yeah, that, that happens and that's okay. So fast forward to today, but just give me some of the, the highlights and what your career career has taken you. Okay. Yep. So like from the ministry, give me some, mm-hmm. and I know like from two book recommendations, um, that you love go giver and, um, challenger sales, I think it's called yep. the challenger yes. sale. Um, I heard you say this and I went out and, and listened to it and uh, because you're a uh, rock star salesperson. I mean, that's kind of where you started, right? And so I would recommend anyone check out that book if you have an organization or you yourself yeah. want to get better, better. That is an amazing book. So thank you for recommending. Sure. Yeah, virtually. that book has been revolutionary. Yeah. So what, what, did you, what did you take out of that book, The Challenger Sale? Oh, man. I... Well, one, I think that changing the psyche around, I was a psychology major, so I love psychology and and Mm -hmm. consumer behavior and stuff like that, but uh, the psyche around decision-making and, and, and purchasing, like why is the people purchase? And oftentimes the challenger sale, a lot of the the premise of this book is there's so many different types of salespeople and I forget exactly all five or six. Yeah. It's like there's a relationship person who you'd think would be the The lone wolf, the best person because they have the best relationship, but actually was not. And the lone wolf was one. And then, um, there's a, there's a couple. Yeah. But then there's the challenger sales person. Mm -hmm. And they just, in, in all their research, a lot of the data that came back, they outperformed in almost every organization by quite a bit. And so the challenger seal is really someone who, um, I mean, you can kind of gather from the name, is willing to challenge the customer on their buying behaviors. So mm. just because someone, per, so here's an example. So part of my career trajectory, I was in commercial insurance, really sexy. Um, and so I got into commercial insurance where, we realize that it's an incredibly commoditized product, right? You go to a broker, you go to a carrier, and your goal is to get the cheapest insurance possible, right? You know, best coverage, cheapest insurance. We realized that, and part of our challenger sale was, okay, 
we need to think about how we position ourselves. All of our competitors say, hey, we can get you the cheapest, you know, cheapest policy, best coverage, et cetera. We said, no, okay, let's stop putting it in the hands of the carrier. The carrier is the one who actually gives the insurance. The broker is the one who just, you know, matches the, the customer up to the carrier. And as the broker, we need to act far more as an advisor than we do as a broker. And so when we get into conversations, a lot of these ideas about gifts and stuff came in this um, season of my life as well, where our goal, once we got into a meeting, we, we shocked and wowed them with our ability to give special things and get into the inbox and, and cut through some of the noise and get meetings. When we get to the meeting, we had to then communicate with them why it is that the way that they buy is, is the wrong way to buy and how that actually hurts them. And so we did that through developing a risk management course uh, and a risk management uh, consulting, if you will. And we gave that away for free. I said, listen, we're going to come in and we're going to help do risk mitigation for your entire company. You're a manufacturing company. You're paying $750,000 a year for insurance. We'll come in. We'll do risk management over the course of about 18 to 24 months. We believe that we cannot be in the hands of the carrier, but instead we can position you as someone who's worthy of a better policy and let's drive your cost down and you essentially force depreciate your policy. And so that was a, a huge learning curve for me was applying the challenger sale to an extremely commoditized uh, industry and positioning yourselves as someone mm. who's you know, the expert in the room. Yeah, you're the advisor and expert at that point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's carried into every business since then. Yeah, so thank you for recommending the book. I, I suggest anyone get it yes. because it's, it's kind of like give, um, give and Take by Adam Grant and mm -hmm. the breakdown of you things that you wouldn't um, they're a little counterintuitive right the givers are the most successful but the givers are also the least successful in the book and i feel like the challenger sale was very similar what you expect is not what it actually happens to be true um yes. so the timeline ministry mm -hmm. or yeah actually, left ministry. college football ministry mortgage right. broker what's what's next yeah so i went uh ministry and I left that because I had an incredible opportunity. Uh, at least at the time, I thought it was incredible. And then You're like, I met my was. wife. I'm out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I met her before. And, and that's uh, like we went into it together. Oh, uh, gotcha. And um, did it for a little over a year. Um, did some really awesome things in it. Uh, but I just felt this pull towards the workforce and, and a, a random relationship that I don't even remember. I can't even think back to how I got connected with this guy. Very well connected in my city. Ended up. Um, connected me with someone else and it was kind of a chain of connections and I ended up landing a job um, or getting an offer for a job that I was like this is a pretty sweet gig um, so I jumped from ministry to uh, IT recruiting mm -hmm. and got into the IT recruiting space got to work with some awesome organizations learned how to sell into fortune 1000 companies um, companies like Scripps who owns HGTV and the Food Network uh, Pilot which is one of the largest gas station changes or cha uh, chains Mm -hmm. And then some other really large organizations, like Team yeah. Health and stuff like that. So yeah. I like going through this because this is the path that leads you to today, right? I mean, all yeah. these things, you pick yeah. up things of what helps you launch in a very short period of time when you did launch mm -hmm. to like a seven figure and beyond company. So yeah. that didn't happen overnight. So anyways, yeah. So IT recruiting. Was IT recruiting led me then from there. I had a connection with the guy who essentially poached me and said, hey, you know, we're doing, we're changing some things about the industry we're in and that's commercial insurance. I want you to come be a part of my team and we're going to team sell into some of these massive whale accounts. Um, that was incredible. That's where I would say I learned the most about sales in that job. Hmm. Heavy commission role. Um, it's all about the grind. And, uh, but uh, something about the guy who mentored me, uh, who's kind of above me there. And, uh, I wish he and I were still on speaking terms. I don't, we're not, but, uh, I, I want to thank him. Did a you ton tackle for, him? What'd you do? Yeah, Thanks. I'd give him a stiff arm. Uh, nah, just what did he teach you? So he, I mean, he he introduced me to challenger sale. He he introduced me to what it looks like to never be desperate for a sale, even if there's a ton of commission on the line. And I think that has served me more than anything that I have I have learned in my career is uh, there will always be another deal. And mm. he who is the least desperate for the sale is typically the one who has the most authority in the room. Mm. It's uh, easy because he knows he's done sometimes, it. though, Joey. Right? I mean, it, it really. How is. do you get in that mindset when you do really need the sale or want the sale? I think it's hard to get there. Uh, yeah. You know, as a 24, 25 year old kid at the time, 
it, for me, it was hard to get there until I saw it happen a couple of times. And then when I actually experienced what it looks like to be an authority in the room, even though you're a 24, 25 year old kid and you're in a room with, we have a city near us called Oak Ridge, which is kind of, they call it the secret city. It's where they, um, it's a lot of department of energy and, and nuclear mm. war, you know, um, or nuclear weapons are developed. And uh, there's just some high, high influential people. And I got to get into rooms with those folks and network with them and had them actually look at me with, with a little bit of authority. I thought it was very interesting for a young kid. And uh, once I started experiencing that for myself, I started to gain confidence in like, huh, this sales thing is not as hard as they make it out to be. It's all about one, being able to get the attention. And then two, when you get the attention, uh, becoming the authority pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And you do that through the challenger sale, through helping educate them on how they're currently buying and how that's, how that's inherently wrong. Um, and then having examples there and then being able to just uh, persuasively ask. You know, I think that a lot of people, it's so simple, but a lot of people fail in the, in the portion where it's like, hey, mm. you've provided authority, you've built trust, you've done all these things, now ask. <laughs> where did you learn so, persuasion? Persuasively asking, did you study it in direct response or copywriters or anyone who? Yes. Well, yeah. So I started to get a little bit more into copywriting uh, at that job, actually. So I think that there I started to learn when I got into these meetings with these, you know, massive manufacturing companies and uh, got to see kind of how they run their business and, and how they make decisions and how I had to somehow as a 25 year old kid persuade this guy who's, you know, bought a certain way for 50 years. These manufacturing companies are family businesses usually that have just blown up and uh, to sit in the room with him and, and be able to convincingly tell him that he's wrong <laughs> And do it in a winsome way that, that doesn't hurt the, or damage the relationship, but instead provides value. Um, I think I just became a, a student of sales. Um, I became a student of people, psychology to some degree, understanding certain how people make certain decisions and why they make them. And uh, really understanding for the first time what an ICP is, an ideal customer profile. You know, demographically, that's, that's obvious. You know, size, location, you know, decision maker titles, et cetera. But psychographically, what is it that they, what does their day look like? What does the CEO of a manufacturing company's day look like? Hmm. What are his, what are his goals? What are his pain points? And what happen points aren't solved, AKA what are the consequences? And then it's what are the objections? So never go into a negotiation without understanding both sides, wants and needs. And then, or at least trying to understand the other side's needs. I think that has probably made me the, the best negotiator, if you will, or persuader is just, I think that empathy is huge in the sales process. Mm. Humanity. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's funny because, um, so one of the people I interviewed, um, Chris Voss from who wrote never split the difference. And I thought mm -hmm. that, but I don't know if you've listened to it or read it, but I have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, you also think you're going to be coming out learning the opposite of what you do. And, and essentially his take on point is empathy. Exactly what you just said, right? Yeah. Actually having empathy. Not a hard exactly right. sales tactic, but it's empathy. I think all business comes down to empathy. I think that all facets of business comes down to understanding and putting yourself in the shoes of the consumer. I think that copywriting and persuasion and closing and even, you know, product development and all those things come down to you understanding who you're selling to. I think I love um, Seth Godin, as most people do. Uh, he talks a lot about building your tribe. Uh, we have an interesting tribe connection pro there with the name. Com, yeah. uh, funny thing about my name, I, I started tribe prospecting. It took me all of 20 minutes to name it, pick the colors and make the logo. Never looked back from there. So, um, <laughs> but it's because I just believe in building community and tribes. So what, was, what Seth talks about is most people create the product, create the service and then try to go find people to buy it. His, his stance and my stance as well. And this takes empathy is understanding a certain demographic of people. You know, uh, looking at this, you know, the whole market spectrum, finding your corner or finding your sliver, going deep with them and then deciding what is it they want and need. And let me tailor my offer or my service to those wants and needs. Um, hmm. I think that's probably one of the most valuable things that I've learned is, is you have to be empathetic in order to understand your buyer. Yeah. So when you talk about the, the buyer and, and the demographic and psychographic, are there any interesting, you mentioned pain points and objections or anything that comes to mind that's interesting that you maybe didn't expect when you, when you dove deep 
whether it was a pain point that you weren't expecting or an objection. Sure. You weren't expecting. Yeah, that's a good question. So I've, I've also learned that different positions have different pain points and needs. So like you can't just say, when you say, when you do account based selling, you have to look at the whole decision making ladder. You have to look at the CEO, the CMO, the CFO, the, you know, the COO, all the people who might be involved, the directors, the coordinators, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They all have different pain points because they all have different needs and wants and desires. They have different pressure coming in from different directions. You know, the CEO of a venture back company maybe doesn't have as much side to side or, or upward pressure, but they have downward pressure from investors. Um, a COO is, he has pressure from the CFO from a financial standpoint and the CEO from a performance and margin standpoint. CMO has pressure from everywhere because, you know, they have a lot of pressure, you know, needing uh, to produce and they usually fall into the vanity metrics uh, issue because that's how they feel like they can provide value to their company is by showing how much they've gotten likes, comments, shares, et cetera, as opposed to driving results. And so, I think that that's been an interesting uncovering. It's just really understanding mm. CEO has way different pain points and goals than the CFO mm. might. And the yeah. CFO might have way different ones than the CMO. And, and being able to uncover that and, and really put yourself in their shoes, again, empathy, and walk through a day. Like what, is, what is Sally the CMO? What does her day look like at a $50 million company? Who does she report to? Who reports to her? Mm -hmm. uh, what is she probably struggling with in relation to uh, – her market to their offer to our offer, et cetera. And, and a lot of interesting things can come from that when you start doing some research and deep dive into that. And even yeah. being willing to pick up the phone and interview people and ask them, say, Hey, I have no dog in the hunt here. I'm just trying to understand the market. You know, what are some things that you struggle with? Thank you for sharing that joy, by the way. It's yeah. I mean, when you put it and break it down like that, it's like, it's not so simple anymore. You know, there's a lot of pressures coming from all directions and not understanding yeah. that at a minimum hurts you, not yes. you, but anyone. Um, so I want to talk about, I geek out on direct response, marketing, cool. copywriting, mail, and you know, your tagline, your offer um, value proposition is amazing and your risk reversal is amazing. So I'm curious how you came up with the Tesla risk reversal and walk through what that actually is because it's in your contract sure. apparently. Yeah, it is. Yep. So, I mean, for one, there, people always talk about money back guarantee or 30 day guarantee, whatever we, for one, we wanted to say, I'll backtrack. We try to push up against as many norms as we possibly can. So, if the industry is doing this, we want to do that. And if they're over here, we want to be over there. And so that's our goal is to always push up against the norm. And so we were saying, okay, even down to our guarantee, we, we know that we can deliver. There's no, there isn't a shadow of a doubt when we're as process driven as we are. And we have as many, you know, what I would call phenoms or experts on our team, you know, I just, there's no way that we won't deliver on this. And the data shows that we've run 400 and probably 50 something campaigns now for over 120 something businesses. I think our website's outdated in that regard. And so all that data shows that we can deliver. And if we feel that strongly about that, then let's look at the consumer. What's important to them. They want to know that they're not the only ones putting something on the line from a psych psychological standpoint, they want to say, Hey, I'm taking a bunch of risk here by giving you, you know, five figures a month to work with us. What are you doing? You know, cause you could just say, eh, it just didn't work out. At the end of the day, I still made 150 grand. Didn't work out for them too bad. And when we say, no, 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 listen, you're putting something on the line. So we, we believe so much in what we're doing that we're willing to put some money on the line and actually lose money in this, you know? And so, when it actually breaks down, we actually stand to lose more money than they do. And so I think from a psychological standpoint, that's one, it's a trust builder, uh, for two, um, it's something tangible. So we choose Tesla as more of a placeholder, but that's legitimately like we talk about that in the sales process with them. Like, Hey, our goal is to never actually have to buy you a Tesla. You don't want a Tesla from us. Cause that means we didn't deliver. I don't want to give you a Tesla. Cause that means that I just went negative on your, on your account. Um, but whatever it is you want, whatever it could be a Tesla, it could be something else. Let's define what's important to you. What's your dream car? You want the dream 500, you want the dream business. What's your dream car mm. or something that's important to you. If it means I have to cut you a $90,000 check, I'll cut you a $90,000 check, but let's put something tangible on the line here that I'm going to work together with you for you to acquire if this doesn't go well. 
And um, yeah, I just think that it's, it puts something tangible in front of them. It says, Oh, it's in the contract. He's, you know, cause the money back guarantee thing is always funny. Yeah. I think what were the other things that went through the, on the chopping block? I'm curious, you know, so money back the things that we'll, 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 yeah, we'll that do. you decided not to do, but you went with the Tesla. Uh, what did we, I mean, we kicked around a couple different things. Um, one was like sending their executive team on a vacation, mm. uh, almost like a man, that was a poor investment, but I guess we'll get to go on a vacation <laughs> together <laughs> again. We've never had to, and hopefully we don't have to do this, right. but, um, you know, those are some things we kicked around. Um, and then obviously the money back was one of the first ones thrown back. We're like, eh, we hate that. So let's yeah. do something else. Um, I like it. Um, what make, when I read that, it made me think of a couple of things. First of all, I love it because it sticks out. And second of all, it probably makes you and the team a little bit nervous. Like you want a risk reversal that it makes you a little bit nervous. But what makes me nervous about it, and I'm not even you, was – you know, the question is how do you train your clients so they don't lose deals? Because you could yes. bring them amazing, like I can tee you up in a pitch and you can, you know, it's up to you then to hit the home run or the base hit. So you could tee them up all you want, but if they don't close a deal, that's, you brought them the dream client and they didn't close them. Exactly. So yeah, and that that's not on you, <laughs> right? Right. So how not, do you train your clients so they don't lose deals and mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit? Well, part of it's qualifying. So on the yeah. front end, uh, we're fairly selective with who we work with. Um, but obviously, Dream 500, we have our dream ideal clients as well. But for us, I want to make sure and understand, one, do you know how to sell? If you don't, do you have someone who does? Um, two, what does that look like for you? Walk me through your sales process. So let's just say an inbound lead comes through. Let's, and, it, and we both know inbound versus cold lead is a lot easier than a cold lead. But let's just walk to the easy one. If you can at least explain the easy one. Then we'll you can't the get the thing. easy one right. Forget about the, yes. the whole and one. And so that's, let's just say hypothetically, someone comes to your pipeline. Um, they've, you've got some auto, you know, marketing automation. You've seen they've been on your website for a while. They've looked around. They finally sign up for a call or whatever your call to action is. You get them on a call. What does that call look like? What's your objective for the call? And they tell me, I can usually tell from that first answer whether or not they're at least somewhat capable. I don't need you to be a rock star salesperson, but I need you to close like 15% or 10%, you know, because that's... That's still, I mean, me, if you're bringing yeah, 10 I mean, amazing clients and closing one, I mean, it's still an amazing ROI, but what, what's like yeah. all-star status in that, in that regard? It's like what percentage? 30%. Should, 30%. 30%. So someone should aim for 30%. Okay. Yeah. I don't like to brag a whole lot, but I'm going to anyways. Um, but I, I, I think that I'm north of 50. Um, so have you thought about just close, just doing, completing that yes. process for them? Yeah, and, they, I've actually been asked by two minute to count at this point. And we are, we do have one and instead of, um, we don't take a fee from it, but it's, it's essentially a, a rev share or an equity model. Mm. So we'll do retainer, which that retainer is for the lead generation portion of, of developing the opportunities mm. of the stream 500. And then it's a rev share slash uh, equity, just dependent upon. We've yeah. done both. So in uh, small small percentage of cases, you will you will complete the yeah. the circle. Yeah, we're trying to make that a more formulated offer right now, because um, that is a big problem that we have found with most companies is uh, you can serve it to them on a platter, but sometimes they seem to drop the platter. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so some things we do, to, you know, that's why we require they work with us for 12 months because I want to be able to see some of those signs by month three or four. I'm like, Hey, we've, we've lined up this many and I, let me back up in the sales call when I'm betting them, I ask them like, Hey, you're putting money on the line. We're putting a quote unquote Tesla on the line, whatever it is that you want a placeholder there. We both have risk here. What happens when I bring you 20 leads over the next three months or four months or whatever it is? What happens if you don't close a single one of those? And then we get into a conversation. And I say, well, here's what I pitch. It, it's, it's, it doesn't mean that I, we're not doing our job. We'll, we'll be the first ones to tell you if we think we're not doing our job. And then for you, it, it probably means there's an indicator there. You told me X percentage, is, this is your close rate. People always inflate their close rate. I think it's hilarious. I've had people tell me they have an 80% close rate. I was like, okay, that's probably because no. it's a referral and it's a family member or something like right. that. <laughs> And it's, um, it's like uh, three out of four people. It's like on a very low number. Yeah, you have a very low volume. Right. Um, you know, one out of two. And so 
um, I, I try to get in there and say, hey, this is what you've told me that you have a 80% close rate. Let's just make it really concerned. Let's say you have a 20% close rate. That means hypothetically, every five leads I bring you that are solid qualified leads at Dream Founder, you should close one. So if we're getting to 10, 15, and 20 leads, you still not close one, then I think there's an issue with the close. And so I'm going to ask them first, what do you think we should do if that's the case? Well, hopefully we never get there, but you know, maybe you can get some pointers or whatever. And so that's usually where I say, okay, well, here's what's going to happen. We're going to keep an eye on this. And if three or four months goes by and we, we drive X amount of leads and you still don't close them, you and I are going to have another discussion. We've still got a lot of time. We still got eight months left on our contract. We're going to have another discussion. And I'm going to essentially ask you to let me coach you on closing. And it's going to mm. cost you money, more money, but it's going to make mm. you way more in the long end. Usually they say, well, why don't you just do it right now? Mm. And I'll do that. Or yeah. they say, okay, deal. Um, and then if they're smart. They're like, just do it on the front end, right? Yeah. Because even if you end. increase it by 10%, that's huge for them. It's massive. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> So that's, that's usually a way that I can prevent that. And I, we are, we have essentially rating scales, uh, each one of our, um, team meetings, we're going to, you know, thumbs up, thumbs neutral, thumbs down on where the client's at. Thumbs up means they're closing deals. We're driving leads, et cetera. Neutral is either they're closing deals, but we're not driving enough leads or we're driving leads and not closing. Thumbs down is we're not driving leads. They're not closing the low volume that we've gotten. And so we need to change and then we start reverse engineer or we reverse from there. Who's who are thumbs down? How do we jump in that right away and do what we call mm -hmm. red alert campaigns? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Neutral is okay. Let's diagnose this. Maybe have a conversation with the, the client and, and figure out what's going on here. What's the disconnect? Yeah. And then if the thumbs up, which hopefully most people are, then uh, we just let it keep, keep doing it. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for, for sharing that. Cause I figured sure. that's what made me nervous, right? Not necessarily. Yeah. You could bring them leads and they don't close them. That's not your fault, but you get blamed for it. Totally. Right? Yes. Um, so picture this, Joey. You're sitting on the beach on vacation. You're talking to your wife. You're explaining your big goals. Um, they feel empty. Mm -hmm. um, talk about what you changed and a little bit about uncomfortable generosity. Sounds familiar. You've done your research again. Um, so, yes, actually sitting on the beach, um, Coronado Island, right off uh, San Diego. And uh, I had just gotten back. This was uh, a year or so ago. Um, I was on a retreat. I have this uh, group that I lead locally called Business Professionals 2.0. Mm -hmm. And it's really just a, a small group of entrepreneurs who are faith-based, um, integrity-driven, want to do both really quality work uh, and do it with a purpose. And uh, we go on these retreats uh, at least annually, if not uh, multiple times a year. And in January, we came back, we went to this retreat, it was incredible, you know, we shot guns, we stayed in this awesome cabin, and we did this exercises on, you know, different things we're trying to learn, what are our goals, and stuff like that. So we set our short-term, long-term, and our BHAG, Big Hairy Audacious Goals, Jim Collins. And um, I came back with all these incredibly lofty goals that I was stoked about for a little bit. And I came home, and I started mulling on them. I thought more about it and I sat there with my wife on the beach about two or three weeks later in San Diego. And, uh, she asked me, I said, Hey, I didn't ask you, how'd your, how'd your retreat go? How are your goals? And as I started explaining them to her, it just, it felt like this empty, all my goals were about me. They were net worth and I do real estate investing as well on the side in the apartment complex. Like so material, monetary type of Very, type yeah. Of and those aren't bad. I don't want to make that mistake of yeah. those are, are the bad things. But for me, it was like, I want to retire at this age and I want to have this much net worth and I want to have this much passive income from our real estate assets and blah, 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 blah. And um, I, as I explained them to her and I, and I thought, to myself after I got done, I was like, I just didn't even feel good. Like she was sweet about it. And was like, Oh, that's interesting. Cool. You know, <laughs> but I could tell like for me, there's a disconnect for her. She's like, yeah. oh, whatever. It didn't Enjoy. excite you as it should have. No, it didn't. And so uh, at the time I had a business coach who um, was really working with me and he was challenging me a ton um, on those goals. He wanted to know my goals and he's just like, dude, you're, if you accomplish those things, you, knowing you specifically, you will be miserable. Net worth goals and you'll just retire by it. this age goals. Is that again. why? You'll just move it? Like you'll just yeah, move it'll just the, be, it'll the just goal be Either I hit them and I just throw it all away and I'm like, ah, eh, cool, I guess what I do now. Or it's, well, that's not enough. Here's the next one. 
Hmm. And, and that, that's common. But he said, I, I think that you need to think about your goals a little bit differently. And so he really challenged me to, to, there wasn't any specific exercise as much as like, what's important to you? And I, you know, I started explaining some things, you know, especially inner city things and, and, and type things like that. And it came down to, there's a couple iterations of my new goals. So I threw those ones out the window and I said, okay, what do I know to be true? I know for a fact that I have met multi, multi, hundreds of millions, millionaires. I've met billionaires and they're not, they've done all the success achievement accumulation and they're not that happy. Uh, I've met, I have one guy here locally in Knoxville who's probably worth three quarters of a billion and uh, the dude's life's falling apart. You Hmm. know, he's not happy. His alcoholic, his family's uh, falling apart to some degree. You know, his kids are falling off the rocker. And so, you look at that and you're like, man, this guy's done everything that I'm essentially setting out to do. And he still doesn't have it, whatever it is. And, and so I started asking myself, Mm -hmm. what, what, what else do I know to be true? I've never met somebody who was incredibly generous with their time, with their money, with their resources and sat on their deathbed and said, man, I really wish I didn't. I really wish I didn't give my time, my money, my resources to this thing or these people to, to give. Yeah. Right. I've met tons of people who, you know, in their older age say, man, I regret spending those super late nights at the office when I had my kid and just stuff like that. They have regrets. We all do. Um, but I've never met someone who said I regret spending time on others um, and, and pouring myself out for the purpose of, of others. And so, mm-hmm that started me down the path of generosity. And so I went from accumulation goals and net worth goals to then saying, how is it that I can be the most generous I can possibly be? Mm. Um, and so that's what kind of stemmed uh, or created the phrase that we use in our company in my life, which is called uncomfortable generosity. How is it that we can continue to push the limits on being generous as a company, as people, um, as spouses, as community members, how can we continue to push that envelope and say, no, I'm getting comfortable with how generous I'm being. Let me push that a little bit further. Hmm. So that's the genesis, if you will, of that. I thank you for sharing that. I mean, I think it's, it's really powerful and I'd love to hear a few examples either from others or you so that people can get an idea of what, what type of goals should they be setting for themselves? Yeah. Well, for me, it started off with just giving goals. Um, and so instead of accumulation, I had a certain number, you know, my wife and I, we, we've always given to the church, to ministries, to different organizations. Um, but it's always just kind of been like, uh, well, this is a, an, uh, an okay percentage to give. So let's just go ahead and give that. It feels comfortable. Instead of that, I think we said, you know what, let's pick a number that's lofty. Like just more than we've even made in a year. And, and let's set that as our giving goal. That's a really hard goal to hit, by the way. <laughs> I've been trying, but it's hard. Uh, and so started as a number, and then the number stayed, but for me, it became far more or far less about the number. I don't want to say I'm going to give, you know, a quarter of a million dollars away this year for the sake of saying, checking that box mm. off that I gave, you know, so I could feel good about myself. I said, okay, I want to give a quarter of a million dollars this year so that I can impact this or I can impact this ministry. And so that was the next iteration was, okay, where do I want to give that mm. money to? What organization? Exactly. And then it said, okay, let me take that a step further. I want to give to the ministry, not because I want to serve the ministry per se, but I want to serve the people that ministry serves. And so it, it allowed me to tie, you know, a dollar figure to the end person who's going to be impacted. Hmm. The ministry is the vehicle in which we're going to have that impact. I can't be the one who's in the inner city every day, but I know someone who can be, and I can help fund them. And I know that they're going to be the ones who are pouring into these 15 through 22 year old, you know, minority kids who need an opportunity. And so for me, it was, let me tie the end impact with the dollar figure. And that actually when things started clicking for me and it got really exciting was, okay, I can tie every dollar and every deal uh, that we do internally at Tribe uh, to impact. And for me, that has been just a game changer for the way that I view business. And uh, when things are stressful, things are hard. I have a, I have a why that's way bigger than myself that mm-hmm. enables me to say, okay, cool. Um, this is tough right now. My to-do list, um, I use OmniFocus 
uh, my OmniFocus is filled with all these tasks and it's overwhelming, but uh, I know that if I can push through this, then I can have an impact on this specific group of people or this specific uh, community. Hmm. So that's one way. And then just internally, like we, in our, in our uh, company, we give um, end of year bonuses, but we also give end of year generosity gifts. And so we want to encourage and, and cultivate a, a community of uncomfortable generosity in our company. And so what we've done and are going to continue to do is we're going to give them a check at the end of the year and say, Hey, this is for you to give. Uh, I want you to choose where this goes. This doesn't go in your pocket. You, here's your bonus. Now here's your generosity bonus. I want you to get in the habit of giving this money to them. Mm-hmm. On top of that, whatever you give at the end of the year on top of this thousand dollars will match that. So let's say here's a thousand dollars, give it to wherever you want. If you say you want to give a thousand of your own dollars, then I'm going to cut you another check for a thousand. So you're going to give a total of $3,000 to this, this organization um, because I want to you to get in the habit of giving and seeing what the return is there. It's not an investment that's going to yield monetary value, but it's going to, it's going to yield impact and it's going to yield purpose. And uh, I want you to feel that. So thank you for sharing that. Joey, have you seen anyone do any, anything specifically like creative with that in the, in the generosity space? Yeah. Like maybe they took it and I don't know, they did some kind of fundraiser or, ju- or they typically just choose a cause that they, they enjoy. Yeah, it's usually, a, it's usually a cause. Uh-huh. I'm trying to, to change it a little bit. Um, and, and we've even tried to do some time. Like most of my team's dispersed, so I can't be in the same city yeah. as them to do this, but um, it kind of goes time wise too. Like, Hey, if you're, if you want to, you know, run this thing at the end of the year, you know, with this nonprofit to help them get gifts to inner city kids and that kind of stuff. Like yeah. I want to do something comparable and my leadership team wants to do something comparable. Right. Um, so there's stuff like that. That's pretty cool. But yeah, I would say most of the time it's, we give money, they give some money on top of that. We match that. That's, that's okay. been the traditional. I can see someone we're like also- cashing it, getting all the, all the thousand dollars in cash of twenties and just standing on the street and handing them out to people or something crazy. I, I think know. that would be cool. I yeah. would be so down for that. There's yeah. a, a cool, so I, I have what's called an, um, uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's essentially a giving fund. So it's just like you would give to a mutual fund. You give to this um, charity or, or giving fund. And um, generosity funds, what they called. And uh, they actually invest that money for you. And, and it actually makes more money that you can give. after. So if you put 500 bucks in there, it might come back and have 530 in there. And you can give now 530. That's how they make their money. Um, but you're able to do that. And uh, there's a, there's a portion that you usually have to give to a nonprofit that's, uh, in some certain, uh, label or they have some sort of regulated, you know, 501c3, et cetera. But there's also an organization called, it's called giving hands where you mm-hmm. can give to this organization that will do some sort of mercy giving. So if you have a neighbor who needs a car, mm. you can't necessarily send that out through a generosity fund and get a tax write off and all those things that come with it. But if you give to giving hands, to then create a uh, a gift or a, or a donation fund, kind of like a GoFundMe type of situation. Yeah, like, yeah. exactly right. It's just yeah. for individual causes, hmm. and it could be for anything. And so I've I've actually not really taught a whole lot of our employees about that, but I, I kind of want to because I think that would stoke some creativity for them hmm. to do some stuff that's not just right. Not just organization. typical. Yeah, exactly. Um, First of all, Joe, I want to be the first one to thank you. I have two last questions for you. Um, everyone should check out tryprospecting.com. Anywhere else we should send people to online to check yeah, it I out. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty heavy on LinkedIn. I have a decent size network. I'd love to yeah. welcome you into it. Um, cool. If you do, I'm getting like 60 invitations a day right now. So wow. if, you, if you would... Uh, That's the power of the Dream 500. No, just... It is the power. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I would, I would actually welcome and i'm not going to accept but maybe 10 of those 60 but uh if you write a note and just let me know you heard me on yeah the podcast that would or be actually awesome. write a personal note i don't care what it says just something personal, exactly you know? if you're just a human i i usually tend to be a sucker for people who are acting like humans so <laughs> um i always ask this joey um since it's inspired insider what's been a low moment you had to push through in your career mm-hmm. And then what's been a proud moment on the, on the other end? What's, what's been a low yeah, moment? I think, hmm, low moment. That's, that's an easy one for me. My, 
wife has a twin brother, um, name's Brendan. Um, probably one of the most inspiring individuals I've ever had the privilege of, of meeting. Hmm. I'm at the, try not to choke up here. Um, you're allowed to, but <laughs> two hmm. and a half years ago, he was diagnosed. So he's, he was, uh, 31 at the time diagnosed with stage four hmm. non small cell lung cancer and uh, it metastasized to his whole body. Hmm. It was full lung coverage, kidney bone, uh, a couple other places and then 24 brain tumors. Jeez. And, um, 31, super healthy, never smoked. Um, just one of those lottery draws of oh, congrats. You terrible. won the lottery of cancer. <laughs> and so, yeah. um, that was just a really difficult time for the family. Uh, it was an encouraging time because I think it drew us closer. Um, and, and praise the Lord. He's, he's now cancer free. Um, two and a half years later. Really? And, yeah. Holy and, cow. And way better shape than I am. Yeah. His, I mean the, the likelihood of him being alive, is uh, a percentage of a percentage. Um, but we, we did some crazy research. We felt like we were introduced to some people that uh, we didn't deserve to be introduced to. And we had a, an incredible team kind of help push him through this wow. difficult diagnosis. And um, it was a hard time for me because it, it just being transparent, it, it, it forced me to start questioning what I believed about, you know, my faith and, and, and people who had, you know, he's he at the time was 31 years old, has four kids under the age of six, mm. uh, beautiful wife. He's a leader in the church, like all these good things. And, and so it, it at first was really challenging for me and it bled into You're like, you know, does God from, exist? Yeah. Just kind of like, does he even, if he does exist, does he care? Like, or are mm. we just all existing here for the purpose of his pleasure? And, and I came out on the other end of that saying, absolutely not. I'm more convicted about my mm. beliefs but it, it took me walking through some difficult things with me and my family, my wife's side, um, to really realize that. And I think in the time where it was the low, you asked the question about being the lowest, it was just questioning that. And when I, when I question that, which I believe is at my core and, and that's my faith and my walk with the Lord for me, as I questioned that it bled into my physical health, mm. my work, you know, all these different things, aspects of my life, it bled into that. And uh, it led me down some depression paths of just, why am I doing this? You know, I wouldn't say I ever got to the suicidal stage, but I definitely, um, I was depressed and, and I didn't really understand. I didn't have any emotion. You know, I was starting to balloon up, <laughs> eating everything in sight to comfort. And, hmm. um, you know, started abusing, you know, alcohol a lot more and stuff like that. So I think it took me walking through that to come out even stronger. And I would say I didn't, even, I didn't become stronger because he was healed. Um, I became stronger because I was forced to face questions that maybe I hadn't asked myself before. Mm. And um, yes, him being healed and yes, him going through uh, that difficult time and watching his wife and four kids have to walk through that. And my wife, who's his twin brother, which you can imagine the relationship there. Right. You know, it was just really difficult. It was a dark time. And um, so that was, that was a low point. You know, it was met with a high point, obviously of him being cleared of any evidence of disease and, He's in that's, better shape than I am. That's pretty amazing. You know, he's, yeah, he's got a great life. Um, what did you change was, afterwards after going through that? Well, it was... I mean, I could see you be like, listen, I give up. Like, forget about this hard work thing. I mean, I'm a, you yeah. know, let's just go on a right? beach somewhere and relax. But I mean, that's not, exactly. your, DNA, that's not well, honestly, your DNA. But It kind of did, though. When you look at my, my goals at the time, my goals... So I walked through... He was diagnosed two and a half years ago. I'd say that the, the next year, year and a half was really wrestling and having hard times. And that's when I started developing these, these other, you know, self-centered goals of just accumulation and all these different things, again, aren't bad. Um, and I would say uh, all at one time, it's just this tidal wave of change for me of like, no, I'm so convinced of what I believe. Mm. I believe that God is for our good. Um, I believe that um, these things are gifts in disguise. You know, like he would even say that. And that's been encouraging to watch him walk through is like how strong he stayed through the whole thing and stronger than most people around him who are trying to encourage him. And um, yeah, I don't know what the original question was, but I think it yeah. was. I mean, it's, it's it how was, you changed and it sounds like you changed your goals yeah. and how you thought And still a wrestle. Yeah. Still wrestle through things. And, you know, now it's, 
you know, I let work get ahead. And I don't take care of my body, you know, and I, I'll eat what I want to eat instead of eat what I should eat and do those type of things. And it's just a process. You know, I think this life yeah. is a, a process and there's a lot of different iterations that we'll go through in our life of changing things and, and, and growing as humans. Um, yeah. But I'm super thankful for that time. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, it's it just, we should all, you know, it just makes us think about being grateful, being appreciative for what we have. And sure. so yeah, I appreciate you sharing Absolutely. that story. Even though it's hard to share, I'm sure. Um, a proud moment. What's been a proud moment in yeah, your career? Proud. Man, this has been this year, I think. Um, obviously, the diagnosis coming back with no evidence of disease back in yeah. February was awesome. But um, or January. But uh, I think uh, outside of that, a uh, really proud moment for me was just l- it's kind of interesting. I've been able to look at the team that I've built, especially the leadership team. I'm just, I'm incredibly humbled and, and thankful uh, that I've built a team of just rock stars. And mm-hmm. uh, I can't necessarily attribute that to me. There's been people who've made incredible introductions for me and stars have aligned in certain ways to where I can land some of these key, key players on my team. There's a moment, I can't think of the exact day or when it was exactly, but it was a little while ago, sometime this year. Or I sat there and I just kind of sat back. I was like, I just don't deserve a team like this. Like this is incredibly humbling that people would want to leave their careers, leave their, I mean, the two guys I'm thinking of specifically on my leadership team left their actual business. They were running a business. Uh, one was a, an operations consultant. He's essentially a fractional COO. And then the other is essentially a, an incredible world-class copywriter who writes for ghost writes for people all over the country the names that we know mm-hmm. and they said they wanted to give that up to be a part of what we're growing mm. and uh that was just a humbling moment to sit back and say wow there's there is uh there's something special that we're doing at tribe and mm-hmm. people want to be a part of it and i certainly don't deserve it but i will i will take it and be grateful for it how did you relinquish sales because i would think like that, inter- was that a really hard thing for you internally yeah internally i i being honest, I still love it. <laughs> I still no, I know, it. but you don't probably do it as much as you do. No, I, I, right? I close, I close deals. And I develop the relationships. Um, I mean, I'm, I hate doing this, but I'm flying down to, to Savannah, Georgia here in a couple of days just to go pitch for one 24 hour period. But I, I feed off of that. I love closing, but yeah, outside of that, the good thing about being a, an outsourced account based sales organization is I have all the resources internally to do it for myself. <laughs> so right. I essentially, we can scale me by doing what we do for our clients, but doing it for me. And so I actually don't mind. The only thing I, I don't like about me relinquishing a lot of the top of funnel sales, so lead generation, that kind of stuff, is I feel like I start to lose a little bit of what's going on Finger today, on the what's pulse, working. Yeah. Right. And so I have to, on a regular basis, re-engage my team to kind of ask them, like, hey, what experiments we run lately? What are we doing? Um, also, we're, this is a something we're launching soon called Lead Lab, which is really just we're essentially going to compile all of our resources and processes and uh, experiments into a free membership portal that people can join, um, so they can look at experiments that have failed and experiments that have succeeded mm. and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I have to have my team kind of educate me still on what's working and what's not, because yeah. you know, what was working two years ago when I was doing a lot of the copywriting and the actual yeah. sales was not anymore. Yeah. I mean, the fundamentals is probably similar, but there may be some, yeah. So yeah, tactics come and go. Yeah. Um, but fundamentals being a human in the sales process, I think that's one of our key core values is just be a human. <laughs> so that Joy. no matter what the medium is. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your expertise, your wisdom, your journey. Um, everyone should check out tribeprospecting.com. Check out what they're doing. Um, maybe we'll convince them just to offer the dream 500. Um, but if not, just if, if you want to actually engage with the dream 500, contact them. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.